March is National Reading Month, and just this past Tuesday was the National Education Association's annual Read Across America Day. Now, the NEA established this day in 1998 as an effort to promote children's literacy. March 2nd also happens to be the birthday of Theodore Geisel, better known as the iconic Dr. Seuss. Well, earlier this week, Dr. Seuss Enterprises announced that six of his books, six, would no longer be published because of supposedly racist and insensitive imagery within them. Why is this happening now? And what seems to be driving this effort as we see other literary works and authors removed from shelves and school curriculums? Here to discuss this and more is the children's book critic at The Wall Street Journal and author of the incredible book Enchanted Hour, The Enchanted Hour, Megan Cox Gurdon. Megan, thanks for being here. I want to start with the six Dr. Seuss books in question. They're no longer going to be punished. They include, and to think I saw it on Mulberry Street, If I Ran the Zoo, Scrambled Eggs, Super, and others. We have um, some graphics I'm going to put up, but the claim is that the illustrations inside depict racist or insensitive imagery. Now, these books were created between 1930s and, and the 1970s. One of the books being pulled was Dr. Seuss's very first book, uh, And to Think I Saw It on Mulberry Street. The book was selected to be pulled because of outdated portrayals of Asian people. Uh, it includes a character described as uh, Chinese, having slanted eyes and eating bowls of rice. Uh, Seuss actually altered the book, Megan, in 1978. And at that time, he said, I had a gentleman with a pigtail. I colored him yellow and called him a Chinaman. That's the way things were 50 years ago. In later editions, I refer to him as a Chinese man, and I've taken the color out of the gentleman and removed the pigtails, and now he looks like an Irishman. Megan, that book was first published in 1937. Your thoughts on discontinuing the very first Dr. Seuss children's book? I think the really remarkable irony here is that the institution or the company that was formed you know, to perpetuate the legacy of Dr. Seuss is now openly erasing it. Uh, it, it I mean, it, it is, it's, it's, we are in an extremely strange time as, um, as you know, and as your viewers know, uh, there is immense sensitivity. Uh, it is the, 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 the discontinuation of these books seems to me, um, a, a great, a, a great, it's disgraceful, frankly, if there is, I mean, mm. if there is vestigial interest in them, if people are offended by them, first of all, people are offended by them. They needn't read them. Uh, secondly, no. if there is, as there should be, of course, scholarly interest in them, as you point out, and to think I saw it on Mulberry Street was Seuss's first right. book, or was the book that sort of established his foothold in the children's industry. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, th these, why ext extirpate them? Why expunge them? There are offensive depictions of all kinds of people and all kinds of things all around us. Just look at Twitter. <laughs> There's all kinds of things. Right. We, we, you know, we cannot, we cannot proceed in a culture, in a, certainly a literary culture, in which uh, f hurt feelings is a justification for, uh, for defenestrating literature. Hmm. I, I, Another I will, book that I will, depicts, I go ahead. Oh yeah, no. So I so I want to talk about something very important. I think because this doesn't get addressed enough, and it's something we really need to unpack when we think about mm -hmm. children's books and what is taking place in the world of uh, world of children's books. And that is that it is there is a now a sort of an axiom in the in the industry and in the educational world uh, that children need to see themselves in literature. And this is understood in a very specific and rather limiting way. Um, now people should be able to see themselves in literature. Well, you might say that's the point of literature. We we read literature, we may not see ourselves as myself as a, you know, a middle-aged woman in the in the Iliad, let's say, but I can see my own pride in the pride of Achilles. I can see my own shame in the shame of uh, of Agamemnon. What whatever we can mm -hmm. we can experience you know, that the multifarious uh, human life by reading books. But what's being understood now is that if, ch if, 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 if books do not present children um, according to very specific identity politics categories, uh, then these books are somehow transgressing um, the bounds of, 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 of proper literature. Um, and then that it. idea... That, that that right, and then that idea can be twisted, right? So that if there is a depiction of a character that is unflattering, or as they say now, of course, problematic or offensive, um, then mm -hmm. that is then an excuse to extirpate the book because children must not encounter mm -hmm. negative images. Um, it's 
it's of course it's it's a kind of tactical campaign to do this, but it's all I mean some of it you know like the road to hell is paved with what good intentions. There are some mm-hmm. good intentions here as we seek to expand the body of books that are given to children and the kind of you know expand the range of of authors and of cultures and whatnot, all of which is you know largely to the good. Who doesn't want more books? Um, right. But in that process, we're also now. We're, we're now kind of chipping away at, at at what used to be a kind of humanistic understanding of the purpose of literature. Yeah. There, there was another book that depicts allegedly offensive images of people in the book, If I Ran the Zoo, believe it or not. Here's an illustration of a Russian dressed in Soviet-style military gear and a Middle Easterner atop a camel. Now, obviously, Megan, This is an artist, in this case, Theodore Geisel's mid-century vision of people and cultures. But uh, uh, frankly, so is It's a Small World in Disneyland. I mean, that has to be the the high temple of uh, stereotypical depictions of races and and cultures and countries in in little dolls. I I guess you got to burn that place down, too. But, you know, you're you're, that's interesting. You you talk about the Soviet or whatnot, you know. What okay, so something might be stereotypical. Stereotypes do not spring from nowhere. They're not necessarily harmful. They might it's it's a way of kind of it's sort of visual shorthand. You want to evoke mm-hmm. something. So you choose, I mean, I'm you know, I don't want to go down on record as the the woman who defends, you know, unpleasant stereotypes. But a stereotype is not always yeah. a bad thing. Sometimes it sometimes it's just a very quick way of communicating something. He's mm-hmm. working with Images that are going to be looked at very briefly, just a couple of lines of text, you know, you just end, as you say, without the sort of, you know, with the mid-century mindset, he wasn't thinking how this, you know, obviously not all people in the Middle East have camels. Okay, you know, (laughs) right? It's, it's, uh, it it, it seems like... um, But not all Americans wear headdresses and cowboy hats either, but that's how you see them depicted in, uh, you know, in certain bits of literature and in comic books. I mean, it was the American ideal in some ways, but obviously that doesn't necessarily equate to where we are today. But should it be banned is the question. Should it be stricken from public consumption? Well, so I'm sure that the Seuss Enterprises people would tell you nothing is being banned. We are merely discontinuing. There's a lot of mm-hmm. um, linguistic uh, gymnastics going on these days about what, what is actually happening. I think actually the, the more apposite word is banished. You know, what is happening mm-hmm. is that classic books are being banished from classrooms, uh, that that uh, the Seuss books are being banished from the general world. And I think, by the way, this, uh, in some ways, my suspicion is with the, you know, the removal of these six titles from circulation, as it were, um, that this is an attempt by the Seuss Enterprise to protect the brand. Uh, I mm-hmm. am, I am not hopeful that they will be successful in this because Dr. Seuss's crimes. I actually have a piece coming out about this on, in, in the Weekend Wall Street Journal. You know, his crimes mm-hmm. are not just these, you know, handful of images that are not completely, you know. Au fait with our times now. His crimes predate his life in children's books. And as we know, we now have mm. this literary culture where um, nothing can be forgiven and nothing can be forgotten. And every offense is still fresh, no matter how often someone apologizes. As, by the way, no. Seuss did, as you pointed out in your, what you were saying earlier on, and maybe in your introduction, that, that he himself, you know, he disavowed and was sorry for some of the right cruder depictions that he had in his earlier career. And in fact, you look at the large, the large body of his work was about, in some ways, you know, making up for that. He he uh, he fought against racism and bigotry and anti-Semitism. Or he invaded against mm-hmm. these constantly, um, using allegory and funny characters and whatnot. But, you know, that was the, that was the point of what he was doing, um, which is yeah. one reason why, you know, he continues to be such a beloved figure. I mean, even before all this happened, um, I reviewed a biography of him a couple of years ago, maybe a year ago, um, and I and I noticed it was really interesting that uh, he's been dead for 20 years, and I think it was something like it was must be I think it was March of 2019. Um, his titles, 15 of his titles, were in the top 25 best-selling children's books in the country. So there's mm-hmm. a massive residual. Uh, feeling of of positive association uh, for Dr. Right. Seuss in the country. I, I want to show you how two literacy advocates are reacting to the removal of these Dr. Seuss books. This is Pamela Good. She's the CEO of Beyond Basics. Listen. 
it's just evidence of how far we've come that we look back at those images and we say, you know what, it just doesn't fit who we are and want to be. And this is Linda Foster Radke. She is president of Story Monsters LLC with a very different take. If they would update the book, if they maybe have an updated curriculum guide that goes along with it and use it once again as a teaching tool, what better opportunity? We cannot shelter our kids from what was, but again, we can influence them on what will be. Your thoughts on those approaches, which is the right approach? Wouldn't it be better to put Dr. Seuss and his books in historical context? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, this is, I argue for this in my, in my book, The Enchanted Hour. Uh, the, the, the solution for problematic or too problematic texts, let's say, is not to remove them, to put them down the memory hole that Orwell had. Um, the, the solution is to add more texts, you know, more images, more discussion. Uh, the, the things can, you know, children are resilient. They can handle knowing that things right. were different in the past. Nobody's putting out these, you know, let's say, um, uh, I don't want to use the word harmful, um, but no one's trying to sell these images, uh, you know, today. We can understand that the past was different. It was another country when, you know, children are old enough to know that. I mean, mm -hmm. even little children can grasp that. Right, right. But, but you know, I have to say, just to, 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 and to think I saw it on Mulberry Street, I remember seeing that as a child. Frankly, I don't remember the, 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 the little Chinese character at all. I mean, I remember that well, when I saw it again, I said, oh, there he is. But as a child, even as an adult, that didn't somehow move me to hateful or racist ideas. I thought, oh, look, the whole neighborhood's here. The cops and the circus and the, and the, the, the guy with the restaurant, it's the whole neighborhood showing up. So I, I think we may be also reading in much more than a child does. Perhaps we're bringing our own biases, or the critics are, to these works. Uh, you think I, that's your spot on there? And the truth of the matter is, if you look at Seuss's illustrations, he's got that wonderful sort of kinetic line and kind of crazy mm -hmm. animals and bizarre scenes. You know, the the human caricatures, uh, or the or in the case of one of the other books, you know, the little Eskimo fish. That's something that you mm -hmm. know can't be seen anymore. Um, right. The, the, these are these are these are ludicrous figures. Uh, all the figures are ludicrous figures. All all mm -hmm. of their attributes are exaggerated. If a character has hair, it doesn't just have hair. It has you know, exploding hair. Um, that's what caricature mm -hmm. is. Uh, and and you're right. I think children are absolutely able to see these things and 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 not mind about them. But unfortunately, unfortunately, we are we are inculcating these rising generations with uh, with a degree of sensitivity to um, personal offense that is not conducive mm -hmm. to a happy and pluralistic society. I'm afraid. And I think we're going to see yeah. more. You know, I, I really doubt that discontinuing these six titles is going to buy the Seuss Enterprises the piece of piece that it would like to have. Uh, I, and mm. I and I and I will even, you know, let, let's even concede that they really are trying to do something genuinely good here. Um, it will not discourage any woke warrior from going after them more. Because as I said, you know, Seuss's crimes are not just in his books, they're in everything else that he did in his career. And we don't now live at a time when people are willing to overlook that. Yeah, I spent a lot of time at that museum, the the, the Seuss Museum in Springfield in the in the Berkshires, and um, mm, when when people get a gander at some of what he wrote, you know, and created before the children's books, uh, the the criticism is going to come down hot and heavy. And uh, by the way, Universal Studios, which has Zeus Landing at their theme parks, they are reviewing a number of the attractions there because they're based on two of these now banned or banished books, uh, If I Ran a Zoo and the Mulberry Street book. So I, I, I see a chipping away here and a diminishment of him in the cultural landscape. Universities, by the way, Megan, before I let you go, across the country, they're not requiring English majors to study Shakespeare. According to a study by the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, only four of 52 universities and liberal arts colleges ranked highest by the U.S. News and World Report required their English majors to take a class exploring Shakespeare's works. They're claiming that they are racist depictions there and, and it represents white supremacy and colonialism. Your thoughts? Ah, oh, it's I, I despair when I hear things like that. It's quite extraordinary. It's like it's like teaching it's like teaching math without teaching algebra, you know? I mean, Shakespeare is absolutely foundational to the English language. 
<laughs> you know, if you're teaching if you're teaching world literature, even then you can't escape Shakespeare. Shakespeare is taught yeah. and uh, all over the world in many languages. Shakespeare is furthermore, uh, you know, emulated and borrowed from all over the world. Uh, universities that cut English majors off from the greatest practitioner of the English language in human history uh, are, are, are neglecting their responsibility. They are betraying yeah. their students. Yeah. As somebody who, who studied Shakespeare, acted in his dramas and comedies and had his words in my mouth nightly, uh, I, I agree with I couldn't agree more. It reshapes your not only your thinking, but your appreciation of humanity and the power of language in it. And to deprive our children of that and, and future generations, it, it, it's criminal. Megan, I wish I had an hour. We will leave it there and we'll have you back. The Enchanted Hour, the miraculous power of reading aloud in the age of distraction by Megan Cox Gurdon is available at bookstores everywhere. You should read it and you can catch her book reviews at the Wall Street Journal. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Raymond. Bye.